Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us here on We On World is One News. I'm Molly Gampir. The countdown for the day Pakistan elects its next prime minister has well and truly begun. Opinion polls say his party, the Tehrike in Saf, may win the maximum number of seats in the July 25 elections. Imran Khan is already being spoken about as the country's next prime minister. And his main rival, Nawaz Sharif, is in jail but is projected to give him a tough fight. Imran Khan is clearly the most sought-after leader in Pakistan today and in an exclusive interview we are getting for you tonight, the cricketer-turned-politician speaks out on his priorities if elected to power, on India-Pakistan relations, on Pakistan-US relationship and on allegations doing the rounds that the army and the ISI are backing him this election. And that's not all. We will also be joined uh, on the broadcast by journalist and author Riham Khan to delve uh, deeper into what Imran Khan has to say. But first up, take a look at this exclusive interview with the chief of the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, Imran Khan. So tell me, uh, let's start right away, what's your plan as soon as you come to power? What will be you, what will your first month look like? Okay, first of all, what, is the, uh, what are the challenges Pakistan will face? The biggest challenge Pakistan faces is uh, we are bankrupt. We, uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, sunk into debts uh, and we do not have the capacity to pay the debts and therefore we are sinking in more debt. So we are in a debt trap. We can't raise enough finances to run our, uh, pay for our expenses, so we have to borrow money. And we have reached a stage where we are not capable of paying back our debts. Um, and so what will we do? What is the biggest challenge the government that comes in has to face? Number one, it has to raise revenues. Have enough money to pay for your expenses. Uh, how does it do that? It, it, it does that by, number one, for strengthening the state institutions that will do two things, collect revenue and stop corruption. Because corruption means our system is hemorrhaging. So we, you know, we have two, the, the twin problem is why we have these deficits, because we do not have the institutions which can collect money and which can stop the corruption. So strengthen state institutions immediately. And that you strengthen them by bringing, ending cronyism, uh, corruption, because you, know, you can only be corrupt if you weaken the state institution, the regulators. So you put people, and we are already trying to play, uh, notifying people who can take on the main state institutions, mainly the FBR, which is the revenue collection. So how to collect revenues. And uh, so uh, strengthen the institutions, cut down corruption, raise revenues, improve governance, that brings in investment. Because you need good governance to bring in investment. At the moment, we are rock bottom in investment. And hence, make Pakistan stand on its feet. Very difficult, it's not easy. Let me just qualify, we are in our worst economic crisis right now. But it's doable if we follow these steps, strengthen our institutions, and then the money we raise, we spend on our human beings human development. What, what is happening in Pakistan is that we are lagging behind human development even in the subcontinent. And uh, subcontinent is one of the poorest places on earth. And so, and the reason is we have, don't have enough money to uh, care for the health of our population, to pay for the education, educate our children, to give them proper justice, clean drinking water, employment for our youth. Okay, and uh, what is the role of Islam in this Naya Pakistan? Pakistan was the only state made in the name of Islam. And what uh, any Muslim state strives for is the first Muslim state set up in Medina uh, 1400 years ago. Is this your model? And that will always remain the model for any Muslim state. We strive to achieve that model. And what was that state? That state was the first welfare state in the history of mankind. Uh, it brought in rule of law, 
meritocracy. And the state took responsibility for the weaker section of the society. So first time, the state took responsibility of the handicapped, of the widows, of the orphans, of the poor people. Uh, and for us, that is what Islam means for us, a humane state. So if you want me to give you an example of, a, of humane states, for me, the Scandinavian countries are the most humane. So closest to the Islamic model. So it would be a mix of Scandinavian model and the Prophet's model? And well, the Prophet's yeah. was compassion. Compassion is what exists in the in Scandinavian countries, where you, you know there's human dignity. There's you know other European countries too. But I think if I have to pick up a model where it's the best welfare state, it's the most humane state. I would pick up uh, pick up uh, the Scandinavian model. Pakistan has a big reputation issue within the international community, and foreigners and foreign journalists like to see in you a Westernized liberal. Is this the case, or are you a conservative? But, you know, what is liberal? Liberal is being humane. Liberal is uh, what I, I understand by liberalism, is where you have freedom. Uh, you liberate your population by giving them law, rule of law. What happens in uh, illiberal societies is might is right. What happens in liberal societies is that the rule of law liberates the people. So, rule of law is very important for the, the weak, the minorities, the poor women, the poor people. So, what I talk about when I say about welfare state, it means looking after the bottom lot, the, which are on the bottom of the ladder. And secondly, it's protecting them by giving them law. Weak need law. The powerful don't need law. So the U.S. does not want the International Criminal Court. The weaker countries want it. So that's why, uh, for me, liberalism is close to humanism. And it, it is close to freedom. So I, I consider myself you know, someone who believes in these principles. So you consider yourself a liberal and a conservative? Uh, but you see, the problem with the Western liberalism is they're stuck in a dogma. They believe that if you're religious, if you have religious beliefs, that pushes you towards uh, illiberalism. You know, for, and it stems from Marxism. When the whole Marxist philosophy came in, they removed religion from society. And Marx, Marxism became religion. And so the left movement always felt that people who were religious were supposed to be on the right. For me, this is nonsense. Because for me, Islam, as we understand, as we understand this, the model for a Muslim state, which was the state of Medina, it was a, I would consider a left state. It was a leftist state. So it was a, it was a, a welfare state. So there's a contrary, the reason why the Western people do not understand, uh, you know, they, because they bracket people. You know, here is uh, someone who's religious automatically goes to the right. Someone who's uh, uh, liberal goes to the left. It's not the case. You can actually have very strong religious views, and your religious views force you to be humane and go on, on the left. And which superpower do you want Pakistan to become close to? Um, is Beijing or Moscow the new Washington for you? I think Pakistan should have, uh, you know, ideally, the, the most important for Pakistan. Is, is peace and stability. We have been ravaged by this. First of all, we got affected by the Afghan war. You know, the, uh, the Soviets, uh, the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan, Pakistan becoming a frontline state. We had these uh, Mujahideen groups, militant groups uh, to fight the Soviets. And after the Soviets uh, left, Americans abandoned us. Pakistan was left with the militant groups and sectarianism, which was even worse. Uh, and so then came 9-11, and the same Mujahideen groups, which were considered heroes during the, the Afghan Jihad, suddenly became terrorists. And hence, uh, Pakistan suffered. We have uh, you know, been destabilized by that whole war on terror. 70,000 people plus dead. Even now, you have the bomb attacks. You know, uh, political rallies being uh, two have been attacked so far, and on top of that, uh, the country just 
uh, uh, lost over a hundred billion dollars to the economy. So you still wish to uh, exit the war on terror that is led by of the course, US? Of course. Uh, so we need stability. We need peace. So we really need uh, to have good relations with everyone. Uh, we do not want a relationship with the U.S. where Pakistan is considered a hired gun, you know, paid to fight their war. We want, a, 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 you know, a relationship uh, a, a, on friendly terms with, with where it's mutually benefit to both. So, uh, and yes, we would like to have good relations with, uh, with all, everyone. With India? Of course with India because, you know, if you have good relationship with India, it opens up trade. And trade with a huge market, Pakistan, both countries would benefit. Problem with India right now is that uh, the issue of Kashmir. Kashmir is, there's a independence, mo freedom movement going on in Kashmir. And India blames Pakistan for that. And so therefore, it, that uh, Kashmiri freedom movement is an impediment uh, between peace between the two countries. Because, uh, you know, uh, the Modi government, Narendra Modi government blames makes Pakistan a scapegoat for what's happening in Kashmir. So you're saying on the Indian part there's no will to, to settle this issue? Uh, I think uh, the relationship probably have been the worst since uh, the Narendra Modi government came in, which is a very hardline government. And, and actually give full marks to Pakistan for trying to get a uh, better relation. But you see, as long as Kashmir is uh, Kashmir is such an issue now because of this movement gaining momentum and then the atrocities of the Indian troops, violation of human rights in Kashmir, then, uh, you know, Pakistan is blamed and Pakistan, on the other hand, has to support the, uh, the Kashmiri movement, freedom movement. So that's the problem right now. But ideally, we should have peace with India and, you know, the whole subcontinent is he held hostage to the... Uh, to the Kashmir issue. What do you respond to allegations that we've been reading for the past weeks that you are supported by the army and the security agencies of Pakistan? The same allegations existed before 2013 election. Uh, when, you know, when PTI burst into the public with these massive rallies and crowds. Uh, again, we had, uh, you know, that ISI was supporting PTI. But when it turned out, the 2000 election were... Uh, all the uh, uh, all the players were supporting the Sharif uh, party, uh, including the establishment. And this all came out because we then did a protest on the rigged elections. And when the hearing took place in the Supreme Court, one of the things that came out was the establishment supporting PMLN. So now what is happening is that first time PMLN is not being supported by the establishment. PML was nurtured, born in the lap of a, uh, of a military dictator. Nawaz Sharif was the protege of General Zia. He picked up a businessman and made him into a, a, a politician. Then ISI backed him in 1990. And there's a Supreme Court case where the ISI chief said we gave paid money to the PMLN, Nawaz Sharif. Then in 1997, they were backed by the establishment. Then in 2013, they were backed. So this time, they are not backed by the establishment. And on top of it, the corruption cases of Nawaz Sharif, he's always got away with corruption cases. There have been corruption cases against him past 20 years. This time, neither the Supreme Court allowed him to get away with it, and the two brigadiers in the JIT, which was formed to investigate Sharif's corruption, neither did they succumb to pressure of Nawaz Sharif. So it's the first time he has not been helped either by the Supreme Court or the army. Previously it was, because this Asghar Khan case in 1990, where he took money from ISI and, and uh, won the elections against Benazir Bhutto in 1990, no one heard the case for 20 years, because he's too powerful. But this time, his main grouse is that the establishment did not help him. And he's attacking the military and the Supreme Court and saying that, you know, uh, uh, they are against me, because he's working from the George Bush uh, saying either you're with me or against me. So he wanted his own umpires and this time he's not got them. So you're saying the ISI doesn't have at all a political role in this election? ISI would have uh, a political role as much as, as it would have in any elections. But to say 
that PGI has been supported is, is going against, you know, if you look around in the public, the only party that is growing massive crowds is PTI. The only crowd party that is actually going out in public and uh, people are supporting it is PTI. So if democracy is people, then pe people are supporting PTI. All opinion polls show that PTI has just gone up. And so to blame, to, to blame our success on uh, being backed by the military is just nonsense. And what personal, I already asked you at the press conference, but what personal relation do you wish to have with Donald Trump to be elected? As you know, personal relations with him are very important in you know, the new American diplomacy. So... Uh, I'm not sure about... Um, what's going to what be your first, first meeting with him? What is he going to I, do? I, I don't know. I don't know whether he'll want to meet me uh, either. But you see, important thing is relationship between the two countries. My whole idea is that, you know, the next relationship with the U.S. should not be this one-dimensional, one-sided relationship. You know, where Pakistan is supposed to be act, to act, and then a few dollars are thrown in its way. It's cost us a lot in the past, uh, you know, 16 years. So we would like to have, a, you know, a relationship which was mutually beneficial. All right, joining us on the broadcast this evening to delve deeper into that interview is journalist and author Riham Khan joining us from London. Riham, thanks very much for making time for us. Uh, as always, many points to speak to you about. Let me begin with this, though. Imran says the only party drawing massive support, massive crowds, is the Pakistan Tehreek in Saf. And to give the army credit for the same, to say the party is enjoying that kind of support on ground is because the, par because the party is backed by army is nonsense. What do you make of the arguments that Imran is making to try and say that he is not being supported by the army and the establishment? Well, first of all, um, I mean, I've uh, written down the points and, and, and just, uh, just look at the pictures. Let's look at the picture. So Imran has been at it for 22 years, he says, and uh, uh, we have Justice uh, Siddiqui going on record and saying, well, everything is being tilted in, in favor of this, uh, uh, this candidate, Imran. Uh, we have uh, uh, The Guardian writing uh, about it as the dirtiest election in Pakistan's history. Uh, that's a major indictment. I mean, if, if you call it the dirtiest elections and we don't have a fabulous history of democracy, what does that actually mean? And then look at the pictures. So Bilawal has has just started his campaign. We've seen him step into the political landscape uh, for the first time. And many of us, uh, me included, have felt that why did they leave it so late for Bilawal to enter into politics? Similarly, Mariam Nawaz pushed into uh, the political landscape um, post Panama and certainly for the NA124, her mother's campaign when she was contesting uh, on, on behalf of her mother, she was campaigning. And look, just compare the videos, just compare the pictures. And why would, would Mr. Imran, Pakistan Tariq Insaf chairman, explain why he was publicly rude to his information secretary on a poor turnout in Jhelum? And, and not only a poor turnout, which is very visible, but he actually went on stage and said, so this is not Raham Khan saying this, maybe the pictures are photoshopped. He stands on one uh, rostrum and says, I think I turned up early. That's why the crowds have not come up. Uh, then he went to another event and he said, oh, I think it's too hot. Is it not hot in Tharpakar? Tharpakar was heaving with crowds for a very young lad who was just entering into politics and uh, hasn't really made that much effort. But I think that people are really connecting to him, and we've discussed this several hundred times. Uh, for Imran to say that he's not being backed uh, by the establishment, I think it's Imran's words are uh, sort of uh, in, in um, irrelevant and, and even insignificant. I think what they need to do is that the establishment needs to make it very clear that they're not supporting this candidate. And how would they make this clear would be if they allowed other candidates to campaign the way they allow Imran, the freedom. Why is it that Imran is allowed to campaign in places where Bilawal has been told not to step out of the house? Why is it safe for Imran and safe for Bilawal? Uh, why is it that Mariam Nawaz is locked up? Why is it that in Lahore, uh, the, the, the main heartland of PMLN and Shabashi's hometown, why is it that we can't see any PMLN posters and PMLN flags? 
So I think uh, Imran doesn't need to explain his situation because nobody believes him. And of course, I have personal uh, knowledge of the fact that he would constantly point to his shoulders and say, well, you know, they're going to get me there and uh, they've taken too long to get me there. So if, if they're not part of this, if they're not supporting him, why are they not uh, making, why are they making it so difficult for other candidates? Forget Nawaz Sharif's family, forget Bilal Bhutto as well. What about Gibran Nasser? Gibran Nasser, the young man who has stood up for everything which is right in Pakistan, he is being publicly assaulted by groups of extremists. No security is being awarded to him. So how is Gibran Nasser? I mean, when we talk about equality and Imran is talking about the state of Medina and he's talking about equality, why I, it's equality, uh, but Gibran Nasser is not allowed that security in a very dangerous situation in Karachi where people actually going up to him and accusing him, hounding his uh, his campaigners, his supporters. Where is the fairness in all of this? So I think that he's, he's, he's not a leg to stand on with this argument. And do you agree, Rehan, that there is an inherent contradiction here where we have the same man who alleged that the elections were rigged, were, was, spearheading the, was spearheading those protests, alleging that the elections were rigged, uh, on the other uh, side of the table now, finding those allegations directed at him, uh, uh, saying that uh, the ISI would have the same political role as it did in any election? Oh, well, you see, again, um, Imran seems to, that's why they call him Mr. U-Turn. And, and it's because, I mean, he doesn't, even in this, in, in, the, in the whole interview, um, uh, you know, he's, he's, what he's saying is, if you listen carefully to what he's saying, he's actually contradicting himself. So I'm sorry, but he's supposed to have read politics in Oxford, and no wonder they say that he had a third-class degree. I don't think he understands Marxism. I don't think he understands uh, socialist theory. And, and the whole point is equality and equality is through economic obviously equality and and you're talking about so one minute when it suits you we say the isi is and we have videos of him on record saying the isi is involved he is talking about he's he spent years saying this in india he's been sitting in indian interviews saying well the isi is wrong he's he's actually sat in india and and said that this certification that he now has of sadik and amin he's been talking about 62 63 in india in england saying that this should be taken out and now when it suits him he's going around uh, bragging uh, th this certification so he's he said that the ISI and the military establishment, even in this interview, he said, well, he's been a protege of, of uh, Nawaz Sharif has been a protege of, uh, of the establishment. So you're actually saying that no one, no one who, can, uh, who doesn't have the backing of the establishment can actually come into power. He's actually saying what all of us are saying. So this time, yes, Mr. Imran is absolutely right. This time, the chosen one is Imran, not Nawaz Sharif. And that's what we are saying. I also want to quickly come to you on uh, the aspect of uh, the plan that Imran has in mind to revive Pakistan's economy, to stop corruption, he says, to end cronyism, strengthen state institutions. All these look great on paper and when spoken, but how practical do these objectives sound, especially given the fact that Imran himself is facing allegations. He himself has said he was too busy to quote unquote and skip the NAB hearing in the helicopter misuse case against him? Well, let's look at the facts. So he's a cricketer and we are cricketing nations, both India and Pakistan. As a skipper, would he ever pick anyone just because he had a gut feeling that this young lad should be given a chance? Would a young lad not go through net practice? Would he not play some sort of uh, local cricket before being played, uh, be, before being put in, in the national team? Uh, he would have had, uh, he would have to go through certain trials. He would have to play for certain teams. He would have to go uh, rise up in the ranks. And even somebody as 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 uh, talented as as Wasim Akram or or Shoei Bakhtar, for example, you would have to go through a process. So here's the evidence. So Mr. Imran Khan had five years to prove himself in KP. And let's look at the evidence. He talks about human capital development. What human capital development has he done in KP? There's 30,000 um, qualified engineers, professional graduates, professional engineers, jobless, in KP, with him, being in power in Khabar a very small province with few problems. How does he expect to go in the federal when he has gone on record and said 
thank God we did not get the federal because, you know, we uh, we were uh, particularly useless in KP. That's Imran saying this on record. Look at their energy production. They came out with claims and they've not been able to produce any electricity in, in KP. Look at the, the rapid transport, the BRT, the, the catastrophe that they've uh, caused there with everyone complaining and even any other government in KP now cannot fix it in the next five years. So really, I think, even as an anchor or as a cricketer, you're based on past performance. You can't go to mainstream 8 p.m. Or, 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 or the 10 o'clock news without having a track record. And I'm sorry, Mr. Imran and his party, the brains of his party, cannot produce a shadow budget to save themselves. Their shadow budget had problems when they were the main contenders. And now they don't have an economy. The problem with them is they do not have a plan for the economy. Now, if they were technocrats with amazing ability, I wouldn't probably have a problem with saying, OK, fine, if he's the large line, if he's the favorite one, maybe they have a plan. But have we got any performance record? This is why we're talking about meritocracy. If you choose people on the basis that they're your friends or that your suppliers right. or that you have still relations with them, I'm sorry, you are bypassing mer merit and you are actually overlooking those who have competency. You asked about corruption. Can Mr. Imran Khan explain why he picked all the corrupt individuals from the Pakistan People's Party? Pakistan People's Party is very happy about it. He's actually cleansed uh, the, the system for them. He's cleaned Pakistan People's Party. We have ideological uh, people like Saeed Ghani winning in direct contest uh, in, in by-elections. But look at Imran's party. It's full of corrupt individuals, full of murderers. As we speak, I just got a text message from someone in Pakistan that he can serve. And he said, ma'am, we believe what you've written because they've put a murderer from Lala Musa as one of the candidates. This is his PTI ideological workers who are still a part of his party complaining that 75% of the, vo the, the candidates that they've selected, PTI, have selected corrupt people with some of them with uh, track records right. of criminal criminality and tax evasion. I mean, how can he justify the right-hand man, Jahangir Tareen, has been disqualified uh, for life. And he has he has been uh, accused by the Supreme Court. He's been, he's been charged by the Supreme Court for lying. So I'm sorry, but you have to walk the talk and it's about time you cut the rhetoric. All right, we're going to leave it there for the moment, Reham. Completely out of time. What will the scoreboard for the cricketer turn politician say? Well, all eyes on uh, July 25th, the day Pakistan decides. We're going to leave it there for the moment, taking a very short break. Thanks very much once again, Reham Khan, for joining us.